speaker is Pierre, Pierre Jacob, about moral grammar. And I, Okay, so this is, I'm going to present to report work that's been done uh, in collaboration with the French developmental psychologist Emmanuel Dupoux, with whom we uh, carried some experiments of which I will not talk at all. Uh, and the main topic of the paper uh, is a discussion of a framework for doing moral psychology that borrows uh, most of the ideas from uh, Chomsky's research program into linguistics. And since, since I have a tremendous admiration for Chomsky's research program in linguistics, and I think it, made, it had a tremendous impact on cognitive science at large, I want to raise some questions for this research program, which was uh, recently uh, proposed and developed by a number of people uh, in psychology and in philosophy. In psychology, uh, an interesting new book by Mark Hauser appeared in 2006 called Moral Minds. Uh, several papers, he has been also publishing in collaboration with a number of papers within that framework, which he calls Universal Moral Grammar. The, I think the main originator, really, of the idea, as you will see, is a philosopher by the name of John Mihain. Uh, I apologize for not reporting any data and for really engaging in some kind of a conceptual discussion of this uh, framework uh, for doing oral psychology that's really based on an analogy between the human language faculty and the human moral faculty. So just to start with, as a kind of a gen very general remark, I just want to say that uh, before moral psychology, empirical psychology, moral psychology was born, I think, probably after the cognitive uh, revolution, something that George Miller interestingly calls the cognitive counter-revolution, that was a counter-revolution to the behaviorist revolution, uh, uh, moral psychology was born in the hands, I think, mainly of the developmental psychologist Jean Piaget in the 1940s and like, well, 1950s, and was carried on then by uh, Lawrence uh, Kohlberg. And before that, for many, many centuries, most of the uh, problems having to do with moral cognition and the study of the human moral faculty uh, were addressed by moral philosophers. Uh, who did theoretical, speculative, conceptual analysis. And I think very briefly, this is really very, we can go back to this in the discussion, but I think briefly, uh, moral <coughs> philosophers have been concerned with, of course, uh, what I call here ground level uh, uh, moral questions, normative questions about how to live one's own, conduct one's own life, and three types of meta level normative questions. Uh, about the nature of moral judgment. They were dealing with semantic issues raised by the status of the utterances of <coughs> moral claims. And I think that the main question, the main semantic question that uh, moral philosophers were dealing with was the question whether uh, utterances of moral claims have truth conditions, whether they represent states of affairs, objective states of affairs, and whether they are, uh, these claims are truth evaluable. And so objectivist moral realists defend to the position that they have truth conditions, and uh, 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 opponents of moral realists deny that uh, utterances of moral uh, uh, claims have truth conditions and truth value and are truth evaluable. Uh, they were secondly interested in ontological questions about how uh, norms and values can fit and, and normative properties, given that moral properties are normative properties, how they can be exemplified at all in a world that is governed by uh, causal principles and natural laws. Thirdly, they were interested in epistemological questions about uh, whether moral knowledge is possible, whether it's possible to have knowledge of moral properties, uh, given the semantic and uh, ontological uh, background. 
So this is just to say that uh, when moral cognition was mainly uh, addressed by moral philosophers, uh, questions having to do with the nature of moral judgment were embedded uh, uh, within a set of uh, semantic, ontological, and epistemological questions. So I think that when moral empirical moral psychology was born, as I said, perhaps it's a bit arbitrary, but let's say at, when at, 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 during the time of Jean Piaget, uh, moral psychology inherited a, a, a long tradition of discussions about uh, moral judgments from philosophers, and philosophers divided into broadly, very broadly speaking, two in two traditions of thinking about moral judgments, as I said, embedded within uh, a number of semantic, uh, ontological, and epistemological questions. And roughly speaking, that the, the, those two uh, traditions were, on the one hand, the tradition uh, which I think can be naturally called moral rationalism, where uh, the paradigm of moral rationalism would be exemplified by the, the work of Immanuel Kant at the uh, end of the 18th century, emphasizing the contribution of reasoning, uh, in his terms, practical reasoning, to making moral judgment. And that tradition uh, stood against uh, uh, another tradition exemplified by the work of the British philosopher David Hume, slightly uh, before Kant, uh, who emphasized the uh, the seminal importance of emotional experience and, and uh, uh, the experience of sentiments to the making of moral judgments. So this is a very kind of rough background, but I think that uh, given that background, the main task of moral psychology is really to provide an empirically supported account of the psychological mechanisms that underlie uh, the human ability to make moral judgments uh, in the presence of uh, social human interactions. And I think, to, uh, again, simplifying somewhat, I think that the main challenges for moral psychology, in a way, that's clear, I think, from if you look at the present literature, both from behavioral moral psychology, from brain imaging, uh, in the context of making moral judgments, that there are two main scientific issues to be addressed, I believe. And that's a kind of a summary again, simplifying somewhat the contemporary uh, empirical situation, I think one uh, challenge is to disentangle the respective contributions made by emotional processes, by emotional responses to the perception of social interactions from the contribution of what I call briefly non-emotional processes, some kind of, as I, I will suggest, uh, computations which have to do with the causal analysis of the social interactions, which is, can be carried by non-emotional processes. So see how the respective contribution of those emotional and non-emotional processes uh, uh, work towards moral judgment. And the second scientific challenge for moral psychology, as I see it, is to understand the contribution made by higher order metacognitive processes enabling humans to make, to offer justifications for their moral decisions. So I think these are the two kind of main issues facing moral psychology. OK, so now I move to what I call the Universal Moral Grammar Research Program. And I will start with a number of significant quotations from advocates of this point of view, which, as you will see, uh, uh, is, uh, 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 relies basically on the idea that a good way to make progress into the psychological study uh, of moral judgment is by uh, making a deep analogy between the human language faculty and the human moral faculty. So I start with a quote from a very recent paper which I think is included in readings for this uh, summer school by the uh, philosopher John Mihai. It's a paper uh, published in TICS, Trends in Cognitive Sciences, 2007, a couple of months ago. And this is what he writes. One research program that has recently gained attention is universal moral grammar. Universal moral grammar seeks to describe the nature and origins of moral knowledge by using concepts and models similar to those used in Chomsky's program in linguistics. 
This approach is thought to provide a fruitful perspective from which to investigate moral competence from a computational, ontogenetic, behavioral, physiological, and phylogenetic perspectives. I move to a second quote from the Mark Hauser in his 2006 book uh, called Moral Minds. And this is what Hauser says, and I think it's very representative of this research program. In parallel with the linguist's use of grammaticality judgments to uncover some of the principles of language competence, students of moral behavior might begin by using ethicality judgments to uncover some of the principles underlying our judgments of morally permissible actions. Grammaticality judgments are delivered spontaneously, rapidly, and with little or no reflection. Ethicality judgments would be delivered similarly, but based on morally relevant actions. In the same way that grammaticality judgments emerge from a universal grammar of principles and parameters, the rules in creature expression, ethicality judgments would emerge from a universal moral grammar replete with shared principles and culturally switchable parameters. So I think it is a very important idea, an interesting one, one to which I felt initially actually quite attracted. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting research program. And you can see, uh, if you accept the analogy, how this research program enables uh, one to raise, let's say, five kind of typical questions which in the domain of moral cognition, which all seem to have a counterpart in the study of the human language faculty. So you may ask, first of all, what is the structure of the human moral competence? Just the way generative linguists are interested in investigating the structure of human uh, 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 linguistic competence. Second, you, you, you may ask, how it's acquired by a human child in the course of his or her ontogenetic development. Thirdly, you may ask how it is put into use in human action, how this knowledge, uh, in the case of language, this knowledge, this moral competence can be used in uh, language performance, either in uh, production of utterances or in the understanding interpretation <coughs> of the sentences uttered. Fourthly, of course, you may ask how it's realized in the human brain. What are the brain areas that underlie uh, this, uh, um, both this uh, uh, moral competence and the uh, uh, moral actions uh, partly based on the moral competence? And finally, you may ask uh, how it evolved in the course of uh, human phylogeny. Uh, of course, uh, it also has the uh, seeming uh, support of two major figures uh, in the 20th century, uh, Noam Chomsky, the linguist, and John Rawls. So what I'm going to do is question uh, this research program. So uh, it may seem as if I'm <coughs> facing an impossible task, because I really feel that the weight of those two figures is very hard to uh, question. So let me move now to a recent quote by Chomsky that seems really to endorse explicitly this uh, research program. Uh, and so I read from a recent paper by Chomsky, David Hume recognized that knowledge and belief are grounded in a species of natural instincts, part of the springs and origins of our inherent mental nature. He recognized that something similar must be true in the domain of moral judgment as well. The reason is that our moral judgments are unbounded in scope and that we constantly apply them in systematic ways to new circumstances. So that seems like the basis in this particular paper by Chomsky of thinking of an analogy for studying the human language faculty around the five questions that I mentioned before and studying uh, uh, the, more, the human moral faculty. Hence, they too, uh, 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 moral judgments, must be founded on general principles that are part of our nature, though beyond our original instincts, the instincts shared with animals that should lead directly to efforts to develop something like a grammar of moral judgments. That task was undertaken by the leading moral and political philosopher of the late 20th century, as he was writing his classical theory of justice in the late 1960s, that is John Rawls, 
In the past few years, these ideas have been revived in important ways by John Mihai, now a law professor at Georgetown University, and has become a lively field of theoretical and empirical inquiry as well. Now, I move to the, the place in John Rawls' A Theory of Justice, where uh, Rawls considers explicitly the analogy. And what he writes there is a useful comparison here with the problem of describing the sense of grammaticalness that we have for the sentences of our native language. Is, sorry. Is, uh, is with the problem of describing the sense of grammaticalness that we have for the sentences of our native language. In this case, the aim is to characterize the ability to recognize well-formed sentences by formulating clearly expressed principles which make the same discriminations as the native speaker. This is a difficult undertaking which, although still unfinished, is known to require theoretical constructions that far outrun the ad hoc pre uh, precepts of our explicit grammatical knowledge. A similar situation presumably holds in moral philosophy there is no reason to assume that our sense of justice can be adequately characterized by familiar common sense precepts or derived from the more obvious learning principle. And what I want to draw your attention to uh, uh, when I think of this quote, which is the seminal idea that was expressed and then picked up by Chomsky, or, uh, uh, and especially by Hauser and Mihai, is that you can actually give two readings of unequal strength, I think, to these remarks by Rawls. I mean, you can give a strong reading, and that's exactly the reading that I think is being given by Hauser and Mihai, which I want to question. And there's a weaker reading. The strong reading is that literally our moral judgments are the output of a process that's a grammatical process, and that, that has most or all of the relevant features of grammatical computations and grammatical representations. But there is a weaker reading, I think, and it's, to me, it's not, not at all clear that Rawls was willing to endorse the stronger reading. And there's, the weaker reading is simply that just as the linguists in Chomsky's tradition, in the tradition of generative grammar, have shown that uh, our ability to make grammatical judgments uh, uh, is evidence for our knowledge of deep uh, uh, computational principles of which we speakers of the natural language are not aware, that we could not explicitly articulate and formulate. In the same way, uh, uh, if we want to understand, to, to provide a psychological scientific account of moral judgments, we should expect those judgments to derive from deep computations which are not accept directly accessible to the introspection of moral agents without, as in the strong reading, presupposing that these computational processes have the form of a grammatical structure. And so I think that's, that's, that's what I want to say about the general role. So roughly what I want to argue is this. I think that the goal of universal moral grammar is to address moral development and cross-cultural moral diversity, the study of these questions, via what Chomsky and linguists call a principles and parameters framework, which is successful, I think. I mean, I'm not a linguist, but I, I will assume that this framework is quite successful in both starting to throw light onto uh, language development in human children and also on accounting for uh, language uh, uh, diversity uh, uh, across uh, different uh, linguistic uh, communities. <laughs> Now, the second, the, the, my, second, my, my second point is that this goal uh, could, of course, not be achieved unless there were both a universal moral grammar and there were uh, moral parameters in the relevant sense. But my third point will be that the kind of Chomskyan argument in favor of uh, universal uh, uh, grammar in the language case, okay, uh, that is based on the poverty of the stimulus, and I will go back to that, um, of course requires the assumption that human linguistic competence has a grammatical structure. Also in the, in the moral case, uh, applying a Chomskyan kind of argument based on the poverty of the stimulus to which I will go back, uh, requires that it be independently established that the adult the mature ability to make moral judgment has this competence, has a grammatical structure. And I want to question the grounds for thinking that the moral competence that's evidence that, that's exhibited by human adults to make moral judgment has a grammatical structure. But if there's no uh, good reason to believe 
that the uh, uh, adult uh, mature ability to make moral judgments has a gr grammatical structure in a demanding uh, strict sense of grammar, then uh, the, the appeal, I mean, then we go back to this weak reading of roles, and we don't make any particular assumption about the format and the structure and the computational structure of human moral competence. But without that, then we could, there could well be an argument based on the uh, poverty of the stimulus that, 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 that the child must know much more than what's available in the environment without uh, uh, making, uh, establishing the conclusion that there is a universal moral government. And of course, uh, so I will, I will ask basically three kinds of questions about moral competence. Uh, uh, I mean, one major uh, assumption of the Chomsky programming language is that uh, grammatical competence is modular in a certain Chomskyan understanding of that expression, modular, which is slightly different but related to the further view of modularity. Uh, so we want to know whether moral competence is modular in the Chomskyan sense. We also want to know, of course, is, is if uh, the moral competence is grammatical. And I want to ask whether there are moral parameters in the linguist's sense of parameters. So let me go back to the, uh, the, the, my way of uh, characterizing the task of generative linguistics. So Chomsky's principles and parameter framework, I think, rest on one basic fact, which I call BF, and four assumptions. The basic fact is that a speaker of a language can understand and produce indefinitely many novel sentences never perceived before. That was Chomsky's grounds for thinking that there is a good analogy to be made between the study of language and the study of um, the, moral, uh, the human moral faculty. And the four assumptions which I kind of extract brutally from the uh, uh, Chomsky framework is that uh, the best explanation for BF, not A, B, I'm sorry, for the basic fact is that every speaker of the language has a tacit knowledge of the grammar of a language of which he's unaware. I mean, and there's much uh, evidence given by Chomsky that that is the most plausible explanation for this. The second assumption is, therefore, that the scientific investigation of the human language faculty should be sharply demarcated from what Chomsky called the ethno-scientific study of speakers' naive metalinguistic beliefs about their languages. That is, that when you do uh, a scientific investigation of the human language faculty, what a speaker believes about the sentences of, of her language, either syntactically, semantically, or whatever, is really mostly irrelevant to the science of the language. The third assumption is, uh, that was brought in by Chomsky, I and mean, that was a technical word that I uh, summarize or encapsulate uh, in a very uh, uh, um, brief manner, that the notion of the grammar of a language, of a natural language, is a finite system of recursive rules whereby an unbounded set of sentences can be generated from a finite lexicon. And the last assumption that I ascribe to the general linguistics program is that from the poverty of the stimulus, so from the fact that there is, there is bound to be more in the mind of a child acquiring a language than what the sample of the sentences of her language that's provided by utterances of members of the community, Chomsky was able to argue that language acquisition must require some kind of innate knowledge of universal grammar, of a set of constraints on what grammatical rules are like, what grammars of natural languages are like, and also further, that each natural language instantiates a particular setting of what he called parameters, and that, so for example, the, the contrast between head first in a phrase or head last in a phrase, whether uh, say the verb phrase, the verb comes first uh, or the verb comes uh, late, for example, uh, that you can, from these, the setting of these uh, parameters, which are discrete things, uh, you can derive the uh, uh, diversity of all natural languages. Now, I want to move now, given the setting of this uh, interesting, uh, uh, I mean, given what I think my understanding of what generative linguistics is all about, I want to consider kind of three, I'm selecting three basic psychological facts which have been uncovered by recent moral psychology, which seem on the face of it to be uh, consistent with, if not to support, the uh, interesting analogy within the human language faculty and the human moral faculty. These are what is called, what 
the, the, the person who discovered the phenomenon, John Haidt, calls moral dumbfounding. The second is something emphasized by Elliot Curiel, a moral psychologist, several years ago, that moral judgments are not revisable at the request of a social authority, unlike uh, conventional rules. And the third uh, psychological fact that's been uncovered is the existence of complex unconscious computations underlying moral judgment required for making uh, these judgments, particularly in the investigation of famous trolley cases which Nicolas uh, discussed in his presentation, The Capital Data. So I will go briefly over those three findings and uh, examine what support they are offer or not, or don't of offer to the uh, universal moral ground of framework. So moral dumbfounding is the expression used by John Haidt in a fairly classical paper uh, published in 2001. I forgot the name, it's a little dog that uh, moves its tail or bites its left up, but it's, a, it's an interesting paper. And the kind of data that uh, Haidt uh, had and found and discussed uh, in, in uh, social, moral, psychological type of data was that he created these small vignettes. And he asked people to make a judgment about the content of those vignettes. So for example, one vignette was, a brother and a sister decide to make love once and only once in their life, to keep it a secret to themselves, to take all protective measures against pregnancy, and they both have a wonderful sensuous experience. Is the sibling's action morally acceptable? Now, uh, where he performed these experiments in the US, a great majority of subjects thought it was morally non-acceptable to do so. But most of all, what he found is that those who had the strongest responses, the strongest who, who uh, uh, expressed the strongest moral objection to uh, this action turned out to be, as he put it, dumbfounded. They were totally unable, when questioned and pressed, to offer convincing justifications, convincing explanations for why they judged this action morally uh, objectionable. So I will take it that this interesting finding shows that uh, not all moral judgments depend on what I call very briefly the high, the metacognitive ability to offer justifications. Uh, Except for how about incest is wrong? Isn't that a justification? Well, the question is, if you are asked why it's a small, then you can't, I mean, if you think it's a basic, some primitives. There's some primitives. Yeah, if it is a primitive, if it is a primitive, yeah. uh, um, right, but I mean, it, it doesn't seem like, well, it's, it's open to question whether, it's, you know, we, we, we think it's an ultimate kind of, uh, uh, and it's the same with driving on the right or the left. Right. So, it's yeah. really dumb. Yeah. 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 Yes, it is exactly what it was. Just, just <laughs> an empirical point, which is that many of John's examples um, refer to things, pardon the graphic nature, yes. um, but uh, one of my favorites, just because the of the power, is the chicken example, right? So, a, a man decides to masturbate with a chicken carcass before cooking and eating it. Okay. Now there is no clear primitive in the sense That's of right. involved in breeding of white right. right. So, so that, 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 that kind of yes, goes around. Uh, Most Susan. people don't know why they're doing anything. You know, yeah. if you ask them, that sort of puzzle. No, but there's it, nothing it, no, special about. No, but morals. what was special uh, was that. I mean, I should have said that probably that Piaget's most of Piaget's development of work had to, <coughs> to do with studying the development of children's moral cognition on the basis of their ability to offer justifications for their moral decision. And so, in, the, in a way, this, this, this finding stands against the kind of uh, prevalent methodological assumption made by moral psychologists around 1950 that you could actually study uh, basic moral cognition in uh, human children by asking them to provide justification for their moral choice. But, I mean, it's, it's become a social psychological truism now that people are terrible reasons for why they do anything. Right. But, but, but you see, I mean, it, would have, it could have been thought that moral cognition is an exception. I mean, that, we, you know, uh, given the emphasis both of Piaget's work in moral psychology and moral philosophical emphasis on the part of the rationalist philosophical tradition on the importance of reasoning, that we would have some clue as to why we make our moral choices. But of course, I mean, in the light of all everything that's now being discovered in uh, 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 social cognitive uh, uh, mechanisms, 
it is less surprising that we are unable to offer justification for some of our basic uh, moral judgments. Interesting point that uh, in the social psychology literature, what is shown very often is that that uh, you are giving rationalizations, but, but really the wrong ones. I mean, you, you, you can demonstrate that that was the reason why he did it. But in these cases, you kind of, you are, you, you are unable to come up with them. Because you push people hard enough to come up with them. No, they, they don't. No, no, so in, in, the, in the incest case, what people say is, well, they, they have, you know, children with congenital deformities. And John says, no, remember, they took precautions. Right. And he says, well, they set a bad example. And he says, well, remember, they did it in secret. Yes. And the subjects say, I don't know why, but it's just wrong. Yes. Yes. That, that's the typical kind that's of dialectic not, that goes on in the psychology. It's exactly like driving on the right. Because, I mean, you can say about driving on the right, it doesn't matter if you drive on the right or on the left, because in the so end you have one or the other. But the point is that say, well, why do you do no, you drive no, on no, the right? No, no, the, the, the problem is, no, no, the problem is that you don't have convictions that you are right. You, know, it's an, it, you are aware that it's a convention. You do it one way in France, you do it one way in England, another way in England, but you don't have the conviction that there is a right way to do it, whereas by opposition, people who think it's morally objectionable to masturbate with a chicken or uh, for, to, 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 lead, to, to uh, authorize uh, uh, incest, have, they have a very strong conviction that they cannot justify. So the difference is that in the case, in the conventional case, people don't care. They recognize that, you know, one way is to drive on. If every, it's a coordination problem, if everybody drives on the right, it's fine. If everybody drives on the left, it's fine. It's just that there's, no, there's no fact of the matter as to which is the right way to do it. And that's, a def that's different. You know. I'll, I'll come back. Okay. So, you can, okay. so how much more time do I have? Because I'm, I'm kind of... Okay, okay, so the, th the second kind of fact which is relevant to Maurice's question is finding by uh, Elliot Curiel uh, that um, few adults and three-year-olds, it's been found, uh, make a fairly strong demarcation between um, violations of moral rules, moral norms, and violations of conventional rules. Uh, and particularly that uh, 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 acceptance of conventional rules can be violated at the request of a social authority without any trouble. So the example that I have here is that if you ask adults, uh, Tom uh, wears the pajama to go to school, uh, and uh, well, is, is it fine? And people would say no. Let's say because it violates a convention. But if you say uh, uh, the, the school teacher uh, says it's fine to wear pajamas to go to school, then people would say, yes, OK, it's acceptable for Tom to wear pajamas to go to school. And this contrasts with Tom hits a little girl for the, for the fun of it. Is it OK? No. But now the school teacher says, it's OK to, in my class. To, uh, for boys to hit little girls for the fun of it. Uh, uh, and you ask people, is it okay? And people say, no, it's not okay. And then this distinction uh, is actually uh, recognized as data from a uh, long time ago, Smetana, by at least three year olds uh, who made that distinction between uh, whether violations uh, are justified by a social authority. In the conventional domain, it's okay. In the moral, non-conventional domain, it's not okay. Pierre, I wonder if I just ask sure. you one thing. Joan of Arc was burnt because Joan of, Arc, yes. Joan of Arc was burnt because she refused to wear a skirt. Now, in your understanding, that's true. I mean, that is exactly the reason why she was burnt. Yes. So that so, is the, you yes. know that's that's what was precisely so, said. <coughs> so, do you think, according to yes. Turiel's views? This was a conventional or a that's moral a good, That's a good question. And I think that if we think of cross-cultural validity of Curiel's initial distinction, we may, uh, Stitch, for example, you know, talk about this in Paris. And I think there may be a problem of, right, of rightly interpreting the distinction as it applies to different cultures, cultures which are really, which we, which are really foreign to us. Right? So I, I suppose that. Why are you French? Like French, uh, uh, well, the 13th, the Brits did it. 14th century. Yes, the Brits. Actually, like, yeah, there's, there's actually some good evidence that while well, adults will shift in the way you're talking about from what some might think of as conventional moral, even in those cultures, 
the young children will hold the same three yeah. uh, yes. uh But but so I, that it's, it, it, it's but I do I do I, I do think that Maurice's point that it, it requires work to uh, determine in cultures which are fairly different from ours whether a rule is thought to be in that community a moral rule or a non-moral convention. That may require work. Or it may be that the, the distinction just doesn't well, hold. Yes. Well, you want to, to perhaps, Stitch wanted to argue that it doesn't hold. No, I, but I, I think it's, it, it has to be argued case by case whether I mean, it's possible to accommodate the distinction by a proper analysis of the culture. But you know, I, I, I'm just. Yeah. The third piece of evidence which has been uh, introduced into discussion, firstly by philosophers that Nicolas Roma uh, 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 talked about this. Uh, is the famous trolley cases here that I illustrate with the, 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 the one of the best minimal pairs of trolley cases because trolley cases are very hard to compare. The, the, the kind of uh, uh, the difference between just switching, turning a switch that will that will divert the train versus actually exerting personal battery on the big guy in order to stop the train to save fire and so on. These are hard to compare because there are so many features of w which make them different than it's hard. But here we have a pretty good, I think, minimal pair that was either invented by John Hyde or by Mark Hauser. And the difference is this. So you have the five people here. The question is whether here Oscar is uh, 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 morally justified in uh, switching uh, uh, here something that will divert the train that will uh, be stopped or, or slowed down and will enable the five people to, to be saved or to fly by a huge object which is on the loop side track here. Uh, but there is a person on this loop track that will be sacrificed if the uh, train is being diverted. Versus the other case is where exactly the same situation, but no big object that will do the job. Only a person will either stop the train or slow it down. And most people, I don't remember the exact uh, statistic, but we can go back to it, say, say that it's much more licit to uh, switch the train in this case than in that case. And the kind of proper analysis of the difference in people's intuition is that in this case, the main instrument of saving the five is the object, and the death of the victim here is a kind of a byproduct that can be predicted or foreseen, but the death of that guy is not an intended means to protect the five, whereas here, the death of, the vic of this victim is the in exclusive intended, not merely foreseen, but intended means by which uh, Ned is going yeah, but Ned is going to uh, save the five people here. So there's this very deep, interesting distinction between a, a foreseen victim but the not, not intended one versus an intended victim that seems to be active in uh, explaining moral, people's moral intuitions to which people do not have direct introspective access. I mean, this requires really analysis in order to see that the relevant distinction is that between uh, merely foreseen versus intended. So what I'm saying is I think that these facts may seem compatible with some of the major assumptions of the universal moral grammar, but I want to point out that they are not sufficient. Uh, and uh, I want first to say that, um, as I spelled, one of the major assumptions of the uh, uh, linguistic program, Chomsky's linguistic program, is that a speaker's metalinguistic, ordinary linguistic, metalinguistic beliefs about the syntactic, semantic, pragmatic properties of the sentences of a language are not part of the human language faculty. That is, the, the, the scientific approach to language is sharply demarcated from what Chomsky calls the ethnoscientific investigation of the speaker's metalinguistic beliefs. And Chomsky convincingly showed that a speaker of a language has automatic intuitions about the grammatical properties of the sentences of her language on the basis of which she automatically forms grammatical judgments. And I want to say here basically that the uh, automatic intuitions about the grammatical properties are the unique basis on which, on the, uh, on which uh, a, a speaker of a language forms her grammatical judgments. But as I will, I'm going to argue, I think the existence of moral dilemmas 
show that there may be a gap between intuitions about social interactions, which are automatically generated by social cognitive mechanisms, and moral judgment about a social interaction or about an agent's act. And it seems to me that it's arguable that both the, moral, the tradition of moral philosophy and also the work of Piaget and Colbert, which is not quite consistent with the discovery of dumb founding by Hay, still suggest that some of an agent's moral judgments may result from metacognitive processes of justification which apply to her explicit moral beliefs so that, unlike in the language case, I think there is good evidence for thinking that a moral agent's explicit moral beliefs <coughs> on which these processes of justification apply do belong to, human moral, to the human moral faculty, unlike the fact that a, a speaker's meta, explicit metalinguistic beliefs about the language are not part of the human language faculty. So on the basis of these general remarks, I want to address the first question, uh, which I said I would address, which is, is moral competence modular? Well, the way to argue that it's not modular in the sense in which uh, the human language faculty, according to Chelsea, is modular, is that I think there is room for top-down modulation of moral judgments. I think, for example, that uh, one's intuitive biases against members of one's outgroup may be overridden by the moral requirement that one ought to comply uh, with the, uh, the explicit request for impartiality. That's just one kind of example. Uh, and then, uh, what do moral dilemmas uh, show? Well, take the, 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 the example, for example, offered by Kohlberg, on which he actually was testing children, uh, the, the development of moral development of moral children. Suppose your loved one is suffering from a disease, the cure is so expensive that you can't afford the disease, should you steal it? And then there's a kind of a tension between uh, 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 saving the life of someone and um, stealing. Uh, I think moral dilemmas arise from a conflict between competing intuitions, like say, saving life versus stealing, and moral judgment may require conflict resolution or adjudication among competing intuitions, which in turn can involve top-down modulation by explicit moral beliefs. We also know from the work of Tanya Singer and others that uh, one's emotional empathy towards a person known to be in pain, for example, is something that's open to top-down modulation by explicit moral beliefs about the person. We can go back to the discussion about the, the, this kind of experiment, if you like, but I think that's important. No, so I'm not denying that, of course, both in the language case and in standard visual perception, there are cases of shift or ambiguities where we can hesitate between, uh, say, two readings or two uh, percepts. Uh, so this is the back rabbit, this is the neck cube. It's obvious if we know from perceptual psychology that sometimes we see this as a duck, sometimes we see it as a rabbit, but nothing changes in the physical uh, information of the uh, stimulus. Same thing, we can see different faces protruding here. Uh, in the uh, linguistic case, we have cases of structural or syntactic ambiguities, like John C. Slime claims can be dangerous, or we have uh, uh, lexical ambiguities where the here bore can either mean uh, that they, 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 you, they were pregnant with you, so to speak, or that they are boring to you. Uh, uh, so it's two different uh, entries for the, for the, for the verb. But, uh, but if you compare those cases of syntactic, semantic ambiguities and perceptual gestalt switch, let's say, with the moral dilemma that I repeat here, I think one's basic difference, but that's up for discussion, I agree that uh, we may discuss it, of course, is that uh, uh, only the solution of moral dilemma seem to require explicit, effortful, strategic, even metacognitive thought processes, whereas these uh, uh, changes are automatic and don't require any kind of strategic, uh, effortful, conscious solution. So, uh, well, I don't think we, we don't have much time. I want to illustrate some of the major distinctions between the uh, modularity of the language faculty and the non-modularity of the moral faculty. This way, uh, we can go back to this little schema in the, in the discussion, which illustrates the top-down modulation uh, of both the, uh, uh, there may be a conflict between intuitions here and explicit moral beliefs. Explicit moral beliefs can actually uh, uh, have an impact on emotional input as the uh, uh, modulation, top-down modulation of empathy suggests and so on. And explicit moral beliefs are maybe required in order to adjudicate between conflicting intuitions. That, that, that's what I'm trying to, to suggest. Uh, 
Okay, I, I'll drop this. Now I move to the second question. That, that was the question about modularity. Now I, I move about the question whether moral competence has a grammatical form, a grammatical structure. Now I, want, I think that one thing I want to emphasize is that moral competence exhibits a feature that grammars of natural languages lack, namely that emotions can be a very important input to processes computing moral judgment. It seems to me that if Chomsky or linguists discovered that emotions are an input, to grammatical computation, they would completely revise uh, their assumptions about what the grammars of natural languages are. Now, uh, the uh, psychologist Blair, Jim Blair, who has studied uh, uh, systematically a population of psychopaths that he compared to a population of inmates with no psychopathic tendencies, has actually argued uh, that uh, psychopaths uh, lack empathy with the the uh, distress cues of <coughs> victims, and that this lack of empathetic mapping onto the distress cues of uh, uh, victims interferes with normal moral development in children that show these early psychopathic tendencies. And he suggests, on empirical grounds, that the ability to respond empathetically to the distress cues of victims is a, make, is a condition or a component of moral competence. To that claim, uh, in his book, Hauser has tried to reply that emotions are not part of moral com competence, but rather are part of moral uh, performance. But I think it's very much in uh, uh, his burden, so to speak, to make the claim that emotional, uh, uh, that empathy with emotions experienced by uh, a victim perceived uh, uh, distress cues uh, are a, a matter of moral performance as opposed to a matter of moral competence. Now, I want to claim that basically in summarizing things, there are four kinds of conditions for uh, the grammatical structure of linguistic, linguistic competence. When we say, when we talk about the grammatical structure of linguistic competence, we mean four things. Uh, well, a generative grammar is, some, is a mechanism that is supposed to map an unbounded set of phonological representations onto an unbounded set of semantic representations, both of which, the phonological and the semantic representations, must have some kind of uh, uh, hierarchical structure. So first point, uh, the phonological and the semantic properties of sentences must depend on the phonological and the semantic properties of their parts, of their constituents, so that the mapping, the grammatical mapping, must have compositionality, must be compositional. So compositionality requirement is the first one. The second requirement is that the mapping between the phonology, between the phonological representations and the semantic representation must be reversible in the simple following sense, that it must be available to both a speaker, who must have a semantic representation to be mapped onto a phonological representation in order to uh, uh, articulate his or her thought, and vice versa, it must be, uh, what must be available to a hearer is that from a phonological input, he must be able to map a semantic uh, representation. So it must be reversible in the sense in which language involves both perception and production. The third feature that I want to emphasize is that the processing is informationally encapsulated in the sense in which it reflects linguistic knowledge alone and not general knowledge about the world. And fourthly, that it's domain specific. So I, I want to offer some arguments for why there cannot be a moral grammar, because there, it's unlikely that moral competence meets those four conditions. And I just want to point out how unlikely it is that what we mean by moral competence should have uh, those four features. So suppose, first of all, which is a plausible claim that's been made by philosophers for a long time, for like, people like Goldman, and, Many other philosophers of action have noticed that John Michael makes a lot out of this view that's been developed in detail by Goldman, for example, another philosopher, that actions have a hierarchical structure that can be given a tree representation. So that just by which I mean that a complex action is a function of constituent acts. And maybe there, are, there is some, even some recursivity that's open for discussion in the in the action system or in the uh, ability to both execute and, and perceive and mentally represent actions. Now, if that was the case, and I accept that it is the case, what could the, moral, the job of moral grammar be? 
Well, the most, I think, plausible claim or interpretation of the task of moral grammar on the assumption that actions have a tree hierarchical structure is to map a structural description of an agent's act onto a moral valence, a moral value, I call it a moral valence, a moral valence of the act. <laughs> well, first point I want to make is that uh, the valence of a complex act cannot be in all cases a function of the valences of the constituents of the complex act. Well, for at least two kind of basic reasons. One, it seems to me, is that some constituents, some acts, which are constituents of the complex act, of the moral value complex act, may lack valence altogether. Or it may be that the very same component acts within a, a, a complex action will have completely different values uh, when embedded in different complex actions. And I just want to gesture to the example I was talking about. Uh, about social intentions in the mirror neuron talk, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde may actually use the same constituent act of grasping a scalpel and applying it to uh, uh, bodies uh, in, in the case of victims, in the case of uh, uh, patients, and it will have a totally different, it will be part of a, a complex act with a totally different uh, moral value. Okay, that's one thing. The second, the second thing is that it's not plausible to think of the mapping as being reversible as in the language case. Uh, because uh, whereas, I mean, it's arguable that you could map the description of a complex act onto a valence, it, what sense is there to, making, to mapping a valence onto uh, its proprietary act, onto its, uh, I think that, 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 that idea makes not, doesn't make much sense. The, thirdly, uh, uh, I think that what I said earlier about top-down modulation by explicit moral beliefs, suggests that the processing implementing the mapping could not be encapsulated uh, in the relevant information encapsulated in the relevant sense. Fourthly, I want to look at two aspects of why uh, moral grammar is unlikely to be domain specific. Uh, if you think of the two trolley cases I examined before, you see that the relevant difference in the computational analysis of the, on the underlying the action performed respectively by Oscar Blair this is the difference between whether uh, the um, victim's death uh, is intended, is, is, I'm sorry, is a byproduct or is merely foreseen versus whether it's intended. But I don't think that this distinction is proper to the moral domain. I mean, it's a very general notion that you could apply to many, many other uh, areas of cognition which have nothing to do with morality. So, for example, if you intend to travel to place A uh, and you look at the map, uh, then you foresee that you will be crossing a number of intermediate places uh, and you will use, you will make use of the distinction between intended and foreseen uh, with no moral content. Uh, here, I may, I may be unfair because I don't have much time, but if you look at Mikhail's own paper, which is the most detailed attempt at showing that, for example, uh, it makes sense to think of a moral grammar as having domain specificity, he offers these kind of tree structures which he borrows more or less from Goldman and which do suggest a similarity with the kind of tree structures offered by syntacticians about natural languages. So for example, uh, about one of the moral cases, it doesn't matter which exactly, it's one of the, it's one of the trolley cases. So he provides this kind of tree structure underlying the action. So we have an agent uh, uh, and then the, 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 the action is being divided into cause and effect. The effect is being divided into patient and event. Uh, the patient is a person, the event is death. And he, there's something he calls a moral transformation. And what he calls a moral transformation in the paper consists in inserting a moral predicate into these three structures so that the effect becomes a bad effect. So he calls this the moral transformation. It has nothing to do with transformations as thought of in linguistics. It's just a kind of insertion rule, uh, inserting a, a moral predicate. So what I want to say is that, well, the alleged moral transformation is not a transformation in any kind of recognizable sense on the one hand. And what this analysis shows is simply that the semantics of English sentences has many or all of the resources to express some of the information about actions that are relevant for moral judgment, but what it doesn't show is that there is, there is a dedicated moral grammar independent of the representation of English sentences which carry or whose content is 
are uh, expressing the uh, moral properties of action, it doesn't show that there is a dedicated moral ground. That's what I think uh, I said. Uh, a few more minutes. Yeah, I want to question now the. Uh, so, I, 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 my argument so far has been. There would be a universal moral, for, for, for there being a universal moral grammar, there need to be a moral grammar. For there being a moral grammar requires at least two things, that human moral competence is modular, and that human moral competence has a grammatical structure. Uh, for in, on this kind of simplified discussion, for having, for having moral uh, uh, grammatical structure, moral competence must meet four conditions. Uh, compositionality, reversibility, information, encapsulation, domain specificity. I took each of these conditions and tried to suggest that moral competence fails to meet the, those conditions. Now I want to, I said the universal moral grammar is a rich, interesting way of thinking about moral development and moral diversity. In order to address <coughs> moral diversity, the assumption has to be made uh, on, on the principles and parameters approach, the assumption has to be made that there are parameters in the moral domain which are sufficiently relevantly like the uh, 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 parameters in the language case. Okay? Now in the language case, parameters are binary switches that can occupy one of two positions and nothing else. Uh, for example, head first versus head last, or pro drop or not pro drop. And furthermore, and I think that's an important uh, uh, characteristic of those parameters, speakers of the language are totally unaware of there being those parameters that are constitutive of the particular language that they speak as opposed to the language spoken across the board. Now, I just use here uh, a number of studies by the uh, anthropologist Schrader, uh, which I, thought, I think is quite revealing. And in one particular study that he did was a study of sleeping arrangements in two very different cultures, one among North American families uh, in Illinois, and the other one among families in India, in Orissa. And what he did <coughs> was uh, he asked subjects who were adults how they would fit bedding arrangements in, in families of seven to adults, two adult parents, and children ranging from age two to age 17 or 18. 16 or so, uh, who would sleep with whom? I mean, who would be, which would be the, the optimal bedding arrangements for a family of seven, given a certain number of rooms, a limited number of rooms? And what he, Schrader, found was different preference ordering for Indian families and for US families. And basically, to give you just a, a little taste for uh, this, uh, what he found, was that for Indian families, the highest rank value was incest avoidance. So it was also for American families. But then the second rank, the, 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 the value that came second in among Indian families was so-called protection of the vulnerables, where the vulnerables are basically uh, young children that you don't leave alone. And finally, the third important value was female chastity, which is that when girls reach a certain puberty age, you do not need that alone either because something about their chastity should be preserved by uh, their sleeping together with uh, another member of the family. But in, in US families, uh, uh, as I said, incest avoidance was also the, high, the most highly valued, uh, uh, the most highly ranked value. But then after incest avoidance, unlike Indian families, the second important value was sacred couple by which uh, is meant the privacy, the private uh, life of the parents during at night. And then children's autonomy, which is, runs pretty much against the idea of protection of the vulnerables. That is, you train children to be autonomous, to be able to face loneliness and so on quite early on at life. OK, so I think that uh, if you think of how, what this cross-cultural study of bedding arrangements suggests to me, is that you, you get competition from values which are perfectly accessible, I mean, I think, to uh, moral agents' uh, consciousness. And the question is, you want to actually rank those, there may be conflict within those values, and particular cultures are particular arrangements, uh, ways of solving the tension between those values. It's not at all as if uh, the uh, cross-cultural variety of moral systems derives from switching 
a on and on or off a binary parameter. Uh, okay, I have two more slides and then I'm done. Uh, this is just to illustrate my disagreement with uh, the way Richard Rorty, the philosopher, reacted in the New York Times to the uh, publication of House's book. He actually uh, suggested a number of interesting criticisms of the analogy between the human moral faculty and the human language faculty, on the basis of which he went on to deny that it makes sense to think of morality as being grounded in our biology. Now, uh, I, don't, I think, I mean, I, I want to point out that it's certainly not sufficient to show that there are relevant differences between the human moral faculty and the language human faculty, that the human moral uh, faculty lacks grammatical structure uh, to conclude that the human moral faculty is not grounded in our biology. I think all these denial would only be established if there was evidence that emotions, mechanisms for supplying intentional causal analysis of the kind required by trolley cases of social interactions are not grounded in our biology, but that, I think, remains to be shown. And my last suggestion, particularly in the light of Susan's presence and work is that maybe the right analogy for methodological and scientific purposes between the human moral faculty is not with the human language faculty, but perhaps we can learn more about how to make progress in the study of human moral cognition by thinking, by taking the lessons of what she and Liz Felty and Stanley and many others and Wim and so on have done uh, in the in the domain of numerical cognition, what they've shown there is that there are different core systems, some of which can show up very early in human life, which uh, enable very automatic responses to certain kinds of stimuli, some of which may even be shared by humans and non-human primates, some might not be shared across different species, but <coughs> my suggestion would be that th this is an interesting way of thinking about how to look for social cognitive core mechanisms that are underlying very complex uh, and culturally uh, uh, variable uh, uh, moral uh, 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 judgments. Uh, and in particular, um, uh, one thing which I think is striking is that, in a sense, if you look at languages across the world, you don't want to say that there are differences in complexity among languages, and perhaps there is no difference in complexity of languages in history. I mean, they, that perhaps ever since there have been natural languages, it doesn't make sense to say that later languages are more complex or exhibit more complicated structures than earlier languages. But certainly in the mathematical domain, uh, where, which exhibits a pretty interesting range of uh, cultural diversity, for example, there are cultures with uh, as, as Susan pointed out in many of her, her experiments, where the counting system is far, far less developed than in uh, the West, or there are, uh, I mean, the, 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 the discovery of the properties of real numbers, of rational numbers, of, of, of zero, were really cultural breakthroughs in a way. Uh, maybe we can think, I mean, that uh, the mechanisms for adjudicating moral conflict also exhibit some of this moral variety in a way that's completely different from the language games. That's, that's what I want to say. Thank you for, for the very interesting talk and as a person who's been trained in the generative linguistics, I really enjoyed your talk and uh, but uh, some of my problem or my first reaction when reading this Mikhail's paper was that it's too Chomskyan. So, uh, uh, and the problem is that uh, Chomsky really has a good PR in the cognitive sciences. So if you look at non uh knowledge about linguistics, is uh, the Chomskyan of course in its uh, narrowest sense. So here in this case it seems that they, they yes. really have uh, yes. personal collaborator to Sherman Chomsky and also one. Uh, those on the neck, which I discussed on Friday, right. is also uh, <coughs> yes. very close to Chomsky. Yes. But uh, well, my, my, my problem is that um, well, uh, there are lots of issues which are very debat
say modern linguists or generative linguists in broader uh, sense, but like Chomsky and linguists in, in, this, in this network sense, like poverty or stimulus, uh, stimulus is a very debatable issue, or compositionality. You mean in language? In, in the study of language? In, study in linguistics, language. yes. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, uh, yes, yes. 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 And uh, just to sh show a point. Yes. If you take, uh, if, if you mention this uh, Schneider and Das study, which is a very, uh, very good reference, thank you very much for that, because it's, it's a typical example of the uh, alternative theory, which is that's an right. It seems yes. Yeah, which is an alternative view in uh, all linguistics to the Chomsky and binary uh, parameters. It is. Principles and parameters in the broader sense, but not Chomsky in the narrower sense. Yes. So your criticism is towards this very Chomsky and the court, and yes. not about some general. Yeah, some I can, I can, I can very well see that one could take that paper as not showing the disanalogy between the study of the human language faculty and the study of the human moral faculty, but as making difficulties for the. Chomskyan picture of the human language faculty, which I want to assume. I mean, for at least I'm not in a position really to reject the Chomskyan picture, and I want to assume it, and that's certainly what the people who are in favor of the universal moral grammar framework, they assume the truth of the Chomskyan approach. I mean, as a byproduct of this work, it may be possible to say that what part of what is shown is that one would like to reject the Chomskyan picture of both what a grammar is, how language acquisition works, the existence of universal moral grammar, and the kind of Chomsky view about what grammar is. I'm not, a, I'm not, that's not my argument. I mean, that is, you're right that optimality theory seems to be able to handle rather well the Schwader view about the ranking of values, and that's an interesting remark which I became aware of recently. Uh, and I would like to pursue the uh, idea that Optimality theory, as I understand it, and it's not a field I know very well, is a formal technique for solving tensions between primitives or between uh, values or, 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 or uh, parameters in a certain sense. And that may be very useful for many purposes. Uh, how, whether optimality theory is an alternative to the concepts of generative grammar as far as syntax is concerned, I think in phonology it seems to be pretty uh, uh, efficient and works well. As far as syntax and semantics is concerned, I, I, I'm totally I, I cannot make a judgment. I know I, I'm not competent. So, so, I, yeah. I, I suggest we discuss it later on. Yes, sure. Very I'll do that. Yes, very good. Yeah. I, I think that you'll find this uh, agreeable given your uh, net conclusion, but. The, I think the case against the Turiel evidence is stronger than um, the way that he presented it. So I'm not sure exactly how he represented um, the work, but Steve Stitch and I and three of our graduate students did a project where um, basically we don't just show that, um, so the, the, the Turiel claim is that um, uh, uh, judgments with regard to harm rights or justice are independent of authority and are universal. So they're generalized across cultures, right? So we show, um, that, in fact, that's only true of, well, that it's, it's true when you use the schoolyard examples that Turiel uses, some of which you get here. But it's not true when you give more, much more realistic real world examples. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, our subjects think slavery in the American South was, you know, horrible. Yes. But slavery in ancient Egypt, well, I mean, they built the pyramids after all. So, you know, it's not so bad. Yes. But moreover, not only did they not generalize across time and space in this way, there are order effects. So if you ask them about ancient Egypt first, then they don't think slavery in the American South was so bad, right? Now, I mean, if this has the deep kind of, you know, uh, 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 stemming from an innate evolved mechanism that is essentially implicit in Turiel's time. I mean, he doesn't. Are he, these children? No, these are adults. Um, uh, uh, then. Um, there shouldn't be these, you know, priming effects, basically. People so should the, the first time you misrepresented your data, you had the majority of people being against slavery in ancient Egypt, in the American South, in all conditions. So all, all you had in this priming effect of small variation uh, within a majority of people who were against it. The existence of priming effect is no counter evidence to the uh, distinction. I mean, you get priming effects for anything on, on any kind of topic. If you put it, you know, put, put it in red characters, you'll have a difference in black characters. 
Fair enough, okay. It is not the case that it, it is true that most of the subjects, most of the time, are opposed to these moral violations. But the, the, the priming effects are not as small as you're representing them. And I don't see how a Turiel perspective can take account of priming effects. Because it's about sure. children. I don't understand. It's a, yeah. it's a developmental theory. I'm not sure what data about adults are relevant. No, 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 no. it's easy to share. Yes, because on any story, I mean, if, if you, I don't, I agree with uh, Pierre's uh, point, but if you to point it on any story, you have the input to, suppose you had a moral ground, you still have to have, the, the input to the system is going to be representations of cause and intentionality, representations that are outside of the moral grammar. That's the input to the system. So the, the there are going to be all kinds of factors that influence that input that will then indirectly um, uh, influence the, the moral judgment made. But so you so so you wouldn't necessarily you you you'd have to separate out whether these context effects are internal internal to the moral assuming there were a moral module internal to the moral module or influencing the the packaging of the information that's input to that module. So if you if you believe in a moral module, that's how that's how you would address those phenomena. And it, it, you know it, that's that's exactly what happens um, when you look at context effects and syntax. Um, even though it's pretty unproblematic that that. There is a syntactic module. That, that is a reframing of the Turiel argument in a modular term, which is not, I mean, that, that's not the Turiel argument. The Turiel argument is, if there's a violation of harms, rights, or justice, then people think it's wrong, period. Okay, because see, that's the output have, of the mechanism. Yeah, but you have to see whether you, whether you are representing that event in terms of harms, rights, or justice. Well, the, I mean, the examples used in the study are, are, uh, are, Intrinsically and self-evidently that way. So there are things about corporal punishment and and slavery and such. So no, but you know, like for example, in, the, in, in this work, uh, in all, all, all cases, even right, you, you have cases of conflict of values, or you have extenuating circumstances, which is not compatible. Uh, for, for instance, regarding slavery, the level of moral awareness, uh, which was greater in the in American South than in ancient Egypt, is of course an extenuating uh, circumstances for the Egyptian and not for the. the, the uh, 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 slave owners of the American South at the time of the uh, of, of, of so, so, so the, and, and the other example, we could go through all, all of the, I know this, your, your study extremely well, uh, really, I would, uh, it's not uh, such strong clear evidence that the distinction doesn't hold that fact, I think it's, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't use it the way you do. Just to continue on the two, two yeah, the, uh, uh, ideas that Dan Tesla was mentioning, I, I actually completely agree with Dan Tesla that I don't, I don't agree at all on the fact that Turiel's results are showing a clear distinction between uh, uh, conventions and universal moral norms. Uh, I mean, children have been living for three years in these experiments in a world where you don't know, just keep people. And, and they are not isolated. They know that there's, not, that there's a world outside of their school. And, and they, don't, they, they have no reason to believe that, uh, that the authority of the teacher is like universal authority. And they have no reason to forget about the norms that are outside of the school when they are inside the school. And th these norms are much more important than, than, than the norms that the, I mean, it's just a matter of the scale at which the norms are applying. It's not a matter of complete distinction between two types of norms. I, I, I don't believe at all in that. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I entirely agree with that. I think there is absolutely, it, to the question, what, what is it that, uh, what, uh, could it be morally grounded? The problem is there is no coherent possible definition of it. There really is no universal morality. There is nothing apart. You know, if you think it's the lowest common denominator, first of all, that's not at all Chomsky. And I mean, Chomsky, you know, Chomsky isn't talking about the lowest common denominator of all languages. That's not what he's talking about. There is absolutely nothing that you can say is it in that particular case. The example which is always picked up is incest. But the point is that if you say the lowest common den denominators of the rules of incest is, let's say, brother, sister, I don't know, mother, uh, parents, children, that it then doesn't refer to any, any 
meaning that you could attach to incest in any particular society. It begins to be a purely analytical notion of incest, which of course uh, is not really relevant, you see. In Madagascar there is one idea which would spread through uh, extraordinarily remote relatives, and people would say, well, if they're very, very remote, uh, it's less strong than uh, your, your own sister, but it's the same thing, and you know, it's always got to be negotiated. So there is no it no, but to I, which you could, you could ask the question about. But I, I think, I think and, and the distinction, I, I'm not, the I'm not, distinction I'm, between I'm not a, I don't want to defend you know, Curiel at all costs, but no, I think that it's one thing to say there are universal moral values, norms, universal moral norms that are apl applied to across cultures. And another claim, which is I don't think it's Curiel's claim, and the other claim is that in all cultures you can find a contrast between people judging violations of conventional rules with no moral content and people judging violations of moral norms with moral content. But then you said, you know, I, and I mean, I would maintain, you know, in different cultures, you said, uh, at least, I mean, you know, this is what Stitch has argued, in deference culture that distinction doesn't exist, and I entirely agree. I mean, I remember my foster mother explaining to me if you stopped eating, uh, uh, if you started eating fish on Fridays, that's what led to Auschwitz. I remember her saying that exactly, you know, and it was, it was very clear what she was thinking about. Uh, now, if you want to say, well, that's deference cultures, please note that 99% of the cultures that we know of would then be deference cultures, and the only other little bit would be philosophers. Um, I'm, I'm, I guess what confuses me here is that um, if the if the parallels across modules were so few, that you had these two domains in which you had moral judgments and another in which you had perfect grammaticality, it would suggest they're not independent modules and that there's something vaguely Domain general. I mean, I, it, it, it's, it would seem to me that it would argue against the position of both of, or actually everyone that you would. Can you can you say more? But I don't well, follow what you're saying. If, 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 the, if the if the argument is an, an, an analogical argument, say here it has very many of the kind of deep features of a uh, of a module. Uh, including some that are really so uncommon that we really only associate them with uh, language. That would be, that, then your remarks would be kind of interesting to beside the point in terms of whether or not they could continue to call it parallel to a, a, a language. That there was a moral domain that was, a moral module that was comparable in some way with a language module. Sure. And if they really meant a much more tight isomorphism, then it would th then it would be odd because you'd have two modules with all of the same features. They wouldn't, by definition, be modules then in some sense. Third, and this seems to be much more problematic, Chomsky, when he's talking to non-linguists, talks about a language model. When he talks about the linguist who generally writes about the constituent features in a sort of a Marlick way about, uh, about language properties and, and processes, those are modules. Right? And, and in that sense, again, making the comparison strikes me as, as um, less well motivated. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I, I don't know what to say. You see, you're right that at least on the third, the last point you made, that, that uh, I mean, he both espouses, Chomsky espouses the view that uh, language competence doesn't rely on other resources of the mind. So it's a kind of uh, domain specific type of uh, processing on one hand, but also he talks about internal constituents of that competence as modules. So for example, binding is one, is one particular component and so on. But um, um, 
I, I, well, to, to, to be very brief, I would not, I, I'm not, my own take on this is that we don't need to assume the, the existence of a moral not good. I think, you know, we can think of the ability to make moral judgment as based on various pretty separate core systems for social cognitive mechanisms which may be dissociable among themselves. And I'm just saying that when we, we think of those core systems and perhaps the adjudicating contribution of higher order cognitive mechanisms, pretty metacognitive mechanisms, in the adjudication process for resolving conflicts between intuitions that are automatically generated by these dissociable uh, social cognitive uh, core systems, we don't have to assume any kind of grammaticality or any kind of the typical pro properties of the, of the, of the grammatical uh, uh, system. If I could make one point, uh, I mean, one uh, aspect of this, the analogy that I uh, kind of find empty or, or empty. hard of, empty or hard to feeling content yes. is, 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 is the uh, uh, poverty of stimulus argument, type of argument where uh, the, basically in the, in, the, in the case of language, uh, uh, there are a set of known learning mechanisms, this is how Chomsky started out, and then he made a powerful point about showing yes. that you could just not uh, mm -hmm. end up yes. with uh, uh, the grammatical uh, competence and uh, generative uh, knowledge if you apply those. Yes. Uh, so, 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 so I wonder if, if uh, and also yes. that certain types of errors uh, by purely associative learning mechanisms would be predicted, which yes. never occur. Yes. Uh, uh, so, so, what is the? Is there anything? That uh, ap apart from you know assuming that uh, parameter setting has to be the structure of the right. curve, maybe you know there are other types of uh, in other fields there are very deep uh, universal grammars which have somewhat different properties. But but uh, is 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 there a case of of a, a, a moral intuition where you would have a hard time explaining how that can how children can come to that kind of unless they have learning yeah. 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 with like, like in the case of language yeah. acquisition, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you're, you're, you're right. Susan, I think you're right. I think your point is agreed. I want to ask you your opinion on a, a different question than, than the question of your talk. Yes. So suppose we agree with you that the analogies to a grammar are really a bad thing. Um, there still is a question of whether there are any involved, um, dedicated moral representations. Yes. And so there are a lot of proposals out there. Right. Um, I mean, so, so you know, the, the proposals about one of the selection gradients for various emotional yes. systems yes. like the discussed Discuss. sure, sure, system, sure. Um, or the, the very concept of morally wrong, yes. or the concept of punishment. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, you know, that that that's a system mm -hmm. that has a a, a moral content sure. in the sense of whatever mm -hmm. people think the function of yes, it is. Yes, yes. But that that idea of there being in some mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. human specific. Yes moral yes, content yes, yes, yes. is left open by your yes, yes, criticism. I, should, no, no, I, and I, I, I guess I, the question is, what do you think? Yes, I, well, um, because <laughs> yes, I, I'm tempted, I think very much along the lines that you... Uh, but you, but that's, that's inconsistent with what you just said, what? that all we need are the cognitive primitives, you said all we need are the social primitives, so well, and, did, yes. and then domain general learning mechanisms. Oh. So those are two very different ways if you think that of looking at it. And, and I think that that's really where the interesting debate would be about moral. So you, when you when you think of discuss, for example, as a system that can be co -op, co opted or adapted say, for, for, for for purposes of, of eliciting moral intuitions about moral actions, where it's initially evolved about say food or something like this, this you, you say is not consistent. No, that's one way of thinking. About it. Yeah, but, but another story yes. is that one of the selection gradients for disgust yes. was, was moral. moral. Right. Okay. So I agree. Of course, sure. you know. It, okay. Uh, and so that, but that's it, that's. Okay. But anyway, the, the 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 it seems that the that two candidates from 
very, very early children, much earlier even than, than the, mm -hmm. the Toriel yes. Shvetlana yes, yes, stuff, yes, yes, yes. are, you know, concerned with fairness and a concern yes. with yes. it not being okay yes. to hurt other people. Yes. yes. You know, yes. Um, I mean, you know, 18 month olds. Right. Um, right. Um, so, so, you know, the question is, is could, could that be evidence for some specifically moral, prepared moral representation? As opposed to social. I mean, you want, you, you, you want to say, you want to talk about preparedness for moral, which is different from moral responding sense, to social interaction. Well, moral in the sense that, that there is an evaluation of the yeah, 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 right. I mean, I, I, I agree. I don't, I don't know the answer, but yeah. it seems to me yes. that that's, it's not, oh, it's that's a the yeah, sure, sure. Yes. So, if you refer to Piaget's work on morality, and we know that he connected his work on the morality judgment with the, with the recognition of intentions by the children, so around the six or seven years old, it's much later, and the earlier research on the theory of mind shows us. But there was a definite uh, relationship between his research on moral cognition and theory of mind. Yes. So I'm wondering whether we agree with the point that because of this, there is not so domain-specific uh, moral uh, module, but there is an intimate relationship between these two kinds of thinking. So theory of mind and, so, and moral Well, I, I, I think that's right. But uh, certainly, my reading is involved if you want to, as you said, uh, uh, if you want to just understand the difference between an, an intended harm and, uh, and a, a unintentional harm. I mean, if, of course, you're not going to evaluate an agent the same way whether the agent harms voluntarily a patient or whether uh, the agent harms non-voluntarily, not looking at it, like on, uh, walking backwards or something like that. So certainly, mind reading is, is having mind reading capacities is going to be fundamental to the ability to provide a, com a, a computation of the causal interaction between an agent and a patient. I, 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 I totally agree that and it would be interesting to test, uh, to try to find dissociation between people who are impaired in their ability to do mind reading and say, for example, uh, make the difference between an intended harm versus a non-intended harm. And, and, and it, it is possible that those people might still be able to empathize with the victim. Now, if you think that uh, uh, empathy towards the distress use of the victim is a component of moral competence, you might look for dissociations between uh, people who have the ability to empathize, no ability to retrieve the distinction between intended versus unintended harm, for example, and perhaps vice versa. Perhaps. Uh, Psychopath might be thought of as people who are perfectly able to map the distinction between intended versus unintended harm and who lack the empathetic response to the distress of the victim. So th th these are the issues, empirical issues, very much to be discussed if we want to understand the basic cognitive mechanisms that are required for uh, moral evaluation. But I agree, I mean, Susan has raised the possibility that is perfectly, I think, open that. Uh, we may have uh, a, a special purpose mechanism for evaluating, and not just for doing causal analysis or responding empathetically to the distress of a, of a, of a patient, but also, uh, say, we have special mechanisms for punishing, for evaluating and punishing. I, I think that's a, yes, perhaps we should stop. I think we should stop because we're running out of time. And